It has long been an ambition uh, for us here in the Shackleton Museum to establish links with other polar and exploration uh, related museums across the world, of which there are many, and many of them uh, small, uh, but doing a really good job. Uh, we spoke earlier to Geir in Norway. Uh, that's not small, that's, that's a big museum. Um, when we heard that uh, Jim, who's one of our committee members, and Joe, another committee member, uh, Geraldine, were heading south um, earlier, late last year, earlier this year, um, we asked Joe to, to please try and establish a link with the museum in the Falklands Islands. Um, sorry, that's the Falkland Islands, um, which he did. And our next session um, is a piece of, from Joe, uh, who will introduce it. And then we have the uh, video from Tasman and Andrea uh, in the Falklands Museum. Hello, Andrea. This is Joe O'Farrell from the Shackleton Museum in Athai. And lovely to have the opportunity of speaking with you again. I have the fondest and the warmest of memories of my trip to the Falklands and to Stanley in February and March of this year, and to the enormous uh, uh, warm welcome that you and your colleagues gave to myself and to my dear friends, Jim and Geraldine McAdam. That's a memory that will never ever leave me. But what also won't leave me is the four impressions I took from my visit to the historic Dockyard Museum in Stanley. First of all, for an island population of just over 3,000 people, you have managed to produce a world standard museum. That is an incredible achievement, considering that the population of the Falklands at just over 3,000 is much, much less than the population of our town of Athai in County Kildare. So on that respect, my compliments to you. Secondly, I, we share something that is rather unique. Uh, in the historic Dockyard Museum in Stanley, you have the reckless hut of Wally Herbert and all that that entails and all the incredible historical significance associated with it. And we in a tie have managed to secure the quest, the cabin from the ship, the quest in which Ernest Shackleton died in January, 2000, in January 1922. So both of us have an artifact that is irreplaceable and unique in the polar world. The third impression that stayed with me from my visit back in February, March of this year is how you, Andrea, and your colleagues have managed to involve the school children of Stanley and the wider Falkland Islands community. The, the involvement of the school children is absolutely incredible. Uh, and to think that their contributions are uh, included e each year in the Falklands Islands Journal is an incredible testimony to their appreciation of their historical connection. We here in Nathai, and indeed in most other communities in the world, could well benefit from your past finders, which is a wonderful expression. So I compliment you on that, and I do hope that we will be able to replicate something like that in Athai in the coming years. And the fourth aspect, Andrea, which has never left me, is how closely we should, our two museums should be involved uh, going into the future. Uh, we have so much in common, not alone the Shackleton connection, but the entire uh, aspect of the Falklands contribution to the polar world and the Irish contribution to the polar world. So in all these areas, I'm delighted to welcome you and to thank you for contributing to this event the Virtually Shackleton 2020. And I would ask you please, Andrea, to express my thanks, not just to yourself, but to Tasman and all your uh, co-workers and colleagues in the historic Docklands Museum in Stanley. Many thanks. I do hope to see you all at some future date. 
Hi Joe, Andrea here. Would you believe it's been almost eight months since you were here in the islands and since you gave your two very popular talks at the Historic Dockyard Museum? Meeting you, I got the impression that you really did enjoy your time in the Falklands and I'm very, very happy about that. Um, I do recall that perhaps you weren't quite used to the strength of our sun because I do recall that you were a little bit red at one stage, um, but I shouldn't laugh. Uh, but Joe, seriously, I'm very keen to keep the link between us going. Uh, so you never know, perhaps one day, um, maybe not in the too distant future, you might see me up north. I would certainly like to visit. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Jim has asked me to record something for Virtually Shackleton on the 31st of October. And uh, that is what I have done. So I hope you enjoy this. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye bye. The early decades of the 20th century were the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Without maps, teams of explorers and scientists set out to unlock the continent's mysteries. They travelled on foot or using sledges drawn by horses or dogs. Nowadays, their equipment seems dangerously basic, but against all the odds, they journeyed deep into Antarctica, accomplishing astonishing feats of physical and mental endurance, and many lost their lives in the attempt. The Reckless Hut is no ordinary hut. From 1957 to 1958, it was a home and a refuge for intrepid members of the Falkland Islands Dependency Survey. It represents the final chapter of a heroic age. Having a refuge was tremendously important in such a harsh environment. It kept the men who lived in it warm and dry, protecting them from the coldest and fastest winds on earth. It also enabled them to relax and unwind after the stress of being outside. The hut was prefabricated in Stanley and then shipped out to the Antarctic Peninsula. Dick Foster, Ray McGowan and Dennis Kershaw moved into the hut in February 1957. Their mission was to trek up to the plateau of Graham Land and lay a depot of provisions for the Hope Bay expedition. After that, the trio would spend the winter in and around the hut, surveying the terrain when possible. In the spring, they would trek up to the plateau again, rendezvous with the Hope Bay team, and guide them down the glacier to meet their ship at Breckless Point. The Hope Bay expedition would be the first attempted journey along the length of the Antarctic Peninsula, sledging from northeast to southwest and traversing its mountainous spine. Imagine you can hear the freezing wind screaming across the ice. You can even feel it rattling the walls. But inside the hut, it's warm and dry. Music is playing on the wind-up gramophone and somebody's telling a joke. You can smell pipe smoke and dinner warming on the stove. Dick, Dennis and Ray were based in the hut for nine months. During that time, they made three main journeys, including the trip to lay the depot for the Hope Bay expedition. In total, they spent 102 days in the field, camping and surveying the terrain whenever the weather was good enough. Coming back to the hut afterwards was the height of luxury. They spent their time in their hut talking, playing Scrabble, sketching and listening to music. They also read for hours. Living in the hut wasn't always easy. Dinner was usually brisket of beef, corned beef or chicken in aspic and it was normally potluck because the labels peeled off the tins. Water was scarce, so clothes and bodies went unwashed. Cooped up together for months on end, there were times when everybody got bored and missed having his own space. But amazingly, they never argued. The Hope Bay expedition met Dennis, Dick and Ray on November 26, 1957. Led by Wally Herbert, the Hope Bay team had just completed the first journey along the length of the Antarctic Peninsula, an arduous 54-day trek in extreme weather with their dog teams, the number ones and the players. After the arrival of the four Hope Bay boys, conditions were even more cramped. With only three bunks in the hut, four people had to sleep outside in tents. Food was scarce and everyone went down to half rations. However, after eight months with no other company, 
the three hut boys rejoiced at the new range of personalities and the opportunities for fresh conversation. Over the next 50 years, Wally emerged as the greatest polar explorer, writer and artist of his generation. He travelled over 23,000 miles by dog sled and open boat, more than half of it through uncharted territory. In total, he spent 15 years in the polar wilderness and mapped more than 46,000 square miles of Antarctic terrain. An Antarctic mountain range and plateau were named in his honour. The Reckless Hut is a survivor of the Falkland Islands Dependency Survey's era of Antarctic exploration. It was saved from destruction and donated to the Falklands Museum thanks to the government of the British Antarctic Territory, British Antarctic Survey and the United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust. The hut was closed in 1958 and for 36 years it lay abandoned with many of its original contents inside. Slowly weakened by Antarctica's icy winds, there was a danger that the hut and its contents would be lost forever. The UK Antarctic Heritage Trust carried out a conservation survey of the FID station in 1994, which highlighted the risks to the hut and its contents. Shortly afterwards, the hut was dismantled and rebuilt at the grounds of Britannia House. But it suffered the wetter weather of the Falklands, so this gallery was designed especially to protect the hut. Antarctic adventurers have to be self-reliant, resourceful and courageous. They need to be able to keep a cool head while enduring some of the toughest physical and psychological conditions on Earth. Above all, they need to put the team before themselves. Sir Ernest Shackleton was a towering figure of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. His Nimrod expedition and Imperial Transantarctic expedition failed in the sense that they didn't achieve their original objectives. However, both expeditions were epic feats of daring, courage and endurance, epitomizing the idea of heroic failure. In 1909, the Nimrod expedition ran seriously short of food and daily rations were reduced to one biscuit per man. One day, Shackleton gave his biscuit to Frank Wilde, who was ill. Wilde wrote in his diary, all the money that was ever minded would not have bought that biscuit and the remembrance of that sacrifice will never leave me. Shackleton died on his quest expedition and he was buried on South Georgia. On the 31st of May 1916, which was the same day as the British and German navies were engaged in the Battle of Jutland in the North Sea, Shackleton arrived at Stanley for the first time aboard the Southern Sky from South Georgia. He was taken ashore to meet the Governor, Mr. Douglas Young, who offered assistance, but no ship of the type required was available. Shackleton cabled London and gave his first account of the loss of the endurance and the subsequent adventures of the expedition. No relief ship from England could reach him before October, so Shackleton began contacting the governments in Latin American countries for help. On the 3rd of June, Shackleton gave a brief account of his expedition in the town hall to one of the largest gatherings Stanley has ever seen. Worsley and Crean were with him as he told a simple and unvarnished story. On his third return to Stanley, Shackleton learned that the discovery was to leave England at once and was expected to be in the Falklands for the middle of September. Shackleton was urged by the Governor to settle down at Port Stanley and take things quietly for a few weeks. He was not keen, knowing that his companions were in dire need, and anyway, he did not appear to be particularly fond of Stanley. He said, The street of that port is about a mile and a half long. It has a slaughterhouse at one end and the graveyard at the other. The chief distraction is to walk from the slaughterhouse to the graveyard. For a change, one might walk from the graveyard to the slaughterhouse. Shackleton departed Stanley for Punta Arenas, arriving there on August 14, 1916. Uh, that's a really nice account of the uh, visit to the Falkland Islands Museum by Joe, uh, Jim and Geraldine. And then it's a lovely message back. Uh, and we hope to continue and build our links. So we've come to the end of our Virtually Shackleton 2020 programme. Um, 
I'm going to hand over to Seamus in a minute who will talk to you about you, the, the important people who tuned in and watched it. Um, I'd like to thank um, the various people here who made this all possible. I'm going to begin with Bethany, Margaret, Sinead and the staff of the Shackleton Museum uh, who facilitated uh, us in our trials and setup today. Um, the whole thing really wouldn't have happened without a, a big level of technology and that all happened thanks to the, the magic of Amanda from Spiderworks and Sheena from Sheena K Consulting. Um, there is very little else left on our programme, well some important things. Um, in at half five we're going to go over to O'Brien's virtually because with lockdown in Ireland um, pubs are closed but we'll go to O'Brien's and Julia, uh, uh, Judith will join us there and uh, we'll have our virtual point. point. And then at eight o'clock uh, we're running the uh, musical and narration piece, Shackleton's Endurance, which um, premiered in 2014. Um, it was commissioned by the Shackleton Museum. We have a narration by John McKenna, music by Brian Hughes, uh, Brian Hughes um, the County Kildare Youth Orchestra, and visuals by Craig Blackwell. So from an organisation point, point of view, thanks very much for looking in, and I'll hand you over to Seamus, who will... Um, Thank you for your role. It's been a very long and enjoyable day for us all here working in the museum today. We've enjoyed the challenge of grappling with digital technology to, to bring the Shackling experience to everyone all over the world. And I just thought people might like to know where people in the world have tuned in from this, from, from this morning till tonight. We've had attendees from Ireland, UK, USA, Australia, Germany, Japan, New Zealand, Poland, Spain, France, Belgium, the Falkland Islands, Italy, Canada, Netherlands, the Czech Republic, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Argentina, Iceland and Brazil. And we've been delighted to have you all here with us for much of this day. This event is not possible without the attendees. There's no point us being here talking to a, an empty audience. So we very much appreciated the feedback during the course of the day, your comments on Facebook, your questions. Um, we're hopeful that we'll return to a more normal Shackleton Autumn School next October. But if not, we can certainly see how we can bring the experience out to the wider world with this. And I think this will certainly transform the way we deliver the Autumn School uh, to our attendees. I can certainly see a balance between a virtual Autumn School and a real Autumn School as well. Because the audience we've reached today, we don't want to leave you behind next year. We want to see you again as well here in, in the Autumn School next year. And I think also, there are important events coming up in the next year or two in Shackleton's life. Uh, 2021 marks the centenary of the Quest expedition. 2022 marks the centenary of his death. And I think we'll certainly, if the pandemic continues to affect Ireland and much of the world, we will try and deliver as much content as we can digitally and live to your good selves anyway. So we'd like to say goodbye. Thank you very much for watching today. And we hope to see you in O'Brien's for Virtual Point at half five. Goodbye. <laughs>